life so hard and why do you seem so far but if this cup won't pass help me to stay steadfast let your will be done you get the glory from this you get the glory from this no matter what I have to go through in this world As long as you get the glory from me
Why you ever chose me has always been a mystery. Cause all my life I've been told I belong at the end of the line with all the other not quite. With all the men to get it right. Well, but it turns out they're the one. Good morning, Bethany Church, and good morning to those of you who are watching online and in a nice, cool, air-conditioned place, maybe. Uh, I can feel there's quite a difference in this room. I feel bad <laughs> for you all out here because you can feel the heat as soon as you walk through the door. Um, but thank you for coming out, and uh, it's great, always great to see fellow believers and worship together. And so I hope you will enjoy this time together today worshiping. Just a few announcements. We've started up Hope Club again for children up to age three and their moms or dads. And they're meeting on Tuesdays at 1030. And also families that want to use the, uh, the playground and nursery on other days can make reservation through the church office or with Natsuki. And the Zoom language classes. I'm not sure if the beginners are meeting today with the holiday weekend. You'll have to check with the uh, the link. But the Monday class is uh, taking off this week for Labor Day and will resume next week. The Japanese Bible study has moved to Wednesdays at 11 in the morning. And the men's fellowship is still here on Tuesdays until McDonald's opens up again. And tennis group is still meeting on Saturdays at 10. We met earlier yesterday because of the heat. So it could get moved up again. That says we may get some uh, heat next weekend as well. Then prayers, we have some updates. Uh, Bobby Kono called and said that her surgery was successful. She got s stitches taken out and the doctor said everything looks good for that uh, removal of the skin cancer and Fumio is here and uh, <laughs> so Fumio had some surgery on his eyelids and uh, he's had some swelling and so he appreciates continued prayer for healing and then the others that were continuing to pray for Alyssa and Lucille and Bob and Jean and Aaron Gray and John Slagle and the family of Ella Kikuchi are there other prayer requests or uh, praise reports? Anything? Yeah, Tomoyuki uh, and then Alexi. Yeah. Okay, Tomoyuki san. Good morning. Mariko and I have a praise report. So Lirika had suffering for um, a kidney problem when she was born. But um, we went to, um, so she had a surgery when she was at three years old. And uh, we had an annual checkup after the surgery. And uh, Friday, this Friday, we went there at UCLA Children's Hospital. And uh, now her condition is much better. And the doctor said that she can graduate from the treatment. So we. We really appreciate your prayers, and we are very thankful to God for his work. Thank you very much. Hey, okay, praise the Lord. Uh, it's been a long journey for uh, Lilica and, and her kidneys. So. Good morning. Uh, so I spoke with Julie Slagle yesterday. Um, she was having bridge work done, and after some of the work, she came down with an infection and had a uh, high fever and has just been feeling a bit woozy and weak. So she asked if you could keep her in your prayers uh, for strength and uh, recovery because she has to have the bridge work finished. And she also has to take care of John. So uh, just keep her in your prayers. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh, Tsugumi san? Yes. Uh, 
um, Denison and Craig's daughter, um, Alison, had um, emergency uh, surgery. Um, I went to see her yesterday at Denise's home. Uh, she's doing um, good, but she still has to um, um, gain um, energy. Uh, she said that you know, one third of her, uh, uh, she lost one third of her blood. So uh, she looked a little pale and then she gets tired e e easily. So please uh, continue playing for Alison's recovery and then um, play for Denise and Craig too. Mm. So, yeah, thank you for that update. Yes, Alison, uh, we need to keep her in prayer as well. <clears throat> any, other, any other updates? Derek? I, I got word from a friend of Derek Kikuchi that there will be a Zoom memorial service for Ella, which will happen at, uh, on September 14th at 1 p.m. And so I will, we will send that link out. And they invited, you know, people, friends or people who knew Ella from Bethany to uh, participate in that service. So September 14th at 1 p.m. Thank you. And I remembered another announcement. Uh, this coming Saturday is the uh, marriage night which is put on by Right Now Media. There's three three couples who counsel people in uh, marriages that will be sharing, and then a Christian comedian. And so that is Saturday at 4. But we'll get the link if you want to register and watch it in your own time at a different time. You can do that as well. And if you're interested in a watch party together, please let me know uh, before, before uh, Friday. Okay, I think we've covered all the announcements and updates, and uh, so let's go to prayer. And Lord, we do thank you that we can worship together. Lord, we thank you for your protection. We pray for your continued protection upon our city and our state with the uh, extreme fire hazard and the extreme heat. We just pray your protection on people that do not have relief from the heat. Lord, we also pray for those in our church fellowship that need your healing touch for baby Canaan and Janet and continued healing for Bobby and for Alyssa and Lucille Honda and for Bob and Jean. Lord, we also pray for uh, Aaron Gray for your continued healing and strength for him and for John Slagle and for Ella Kikuchi's family. We pray continued healing for Fumio and also for Allison. And we just pray that she'd continue to protect our church and families from the coronavirus. And we do pray, Lord, that you would bring the numbers down in our county and our state so that we can uh, move on to more opening of uh, services. And Lord, we we also just want to praise you and thank you today for your continued mercy and grace, for your continued provision for the church. We, we thank you for the offerings that you have brought in and that you have continued to sustain Bethany Church and many other churches that I hear testimonies from, that your people are still able to faithfully give, and we thank you for that. Lord, we pray that you would give wisdom and guidance to our leaders both local, state, and federal leaders. We pray for peace in our country. We pray that for peaceful protests, that they will bring about good results. And we pray, Lord, that you would heal the divisions and divides in our land. So, Lord, we commit this service into your hand. We pray your anointing upon Derek as he shares from your word. And we just pray that this will be a time of lifting you up and encouraging each one who is participating with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we will be singing um, 
three songs here before the message, so you're free to stand or sit, and uh, if you like to sing, please keep your masks on while you're singing. Our first, first song is Majesty, and we will sing that in English and then in Japanese. And as soon as I get my music here, okay. So English and Japanese, and then we'll repeat the chorus in English.
thy word, taken from Psalm 119, which is the psalm for today. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. to our path and a lamp to our feet and we are just so blessed to have your love letter written to us and Lord we just thank you and praise you for being the word the living word in Jesus name we pray amen Now, Derek told me I had to read all 176 verses in Hebrew uh, yeah. <laughs> and then in English, and then the message will be uh, two minutes long. So, uh, but seriously, we will just read um, from verse 9 to verse 16 in English from the uh, English Standard Version. How can a young man keep his way pure? by guarding it according to your word. 
With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth and the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Good morning. And it was really nice to see so many people out last Sunday for our church picnic. I think that was a really great time of fellowship and worship together. And I'm just thankful that the church picnic was last Sunday and not this Sunday. Pastor Chuck, if you may remember, shared a great message with us from Psalm 111 and 112, describing the character of God and subsequently the character of the people of God and how we are called to be steadfast in the Lord. And one of the things he shared about is the righteous man or the righteous person being steady, being firm in the faith and being unwavering. And part of that steadfastness of faith for us as followers of Christ comes from being rooted, right? Being rooted in the word of God. And so as we continue our series in the Psalms this morning, we will be looking at Psalm 119, which a uh, psalm that if you read through the 170 verses of the psalm, you'll find it's a psalm that really emphasizes the importance of God's word in the life of believers. And it is, with those 170 verses, it is the longest among the 150 psalms. And just like last week, it's interesting, and that's why... One of the reasons why Pastor Chuck quipped about reading it in Hebrew, it's very interesting. It's an acrostic. So each section of eight lines begins with the sub, all the different letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And so um, that's kind of an interesting feature of that psalm. And we will just be focusing on a few verses this morning. So we won't have to sit out in the heat for the next several hours or so. So as we begin our time together uh, this morning, please join me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for um, this beautiful day, this warm day, but we thank you that we can come together and worship you this morning. And Father, we thank you for your word. And as Pastor Chuck says that, said that you are the living word. And so, Lord, this word that continues to speak to us even today. And so we just ask that as we come to this psalm this morning, that um, your Holy Spirit would come and illuminate the word to us and that it would just be a blessing to us this morning and that we would take your word to heart and then we would go out into the world and be doers of your word. And so we lift this time up to you and we ask that you would teach us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you walk into your local bookstore, you can probably find a handbook on just about any type of topic. Wait just a minute. I said, if you walk into your local bookstore, well, we're living in the year 2021. We're in the 21st century, and we're living in the middle of a pandemic when you probably can't go into a bookstore. So. I guess I should have started off, well, uh, if you log on to Amazon.com or you get on your Kindle app, you can probably find a handbook for just about anything. Now, the Webster Dictionary defines a handbook as a book capable of being conveniently carried as a ready reference or a concise reference book covering a particular subject. And I was thinking about some of the handbooks that I've had over the course of my life, and I haven't spent all day moving yesterday, and so I'm kind of disorganized and not finished unpacking, but, and so I forgot to bring it, but one of the things I came across as I was unpacking was a book that I have uh, in my collection called The Handbook of United States Coins, 1992. 
And now by now, uh, all of you probably know that I'm kind of a nerd. Yes, I am. And one of the things I nerd out on is coins. And fact is, I've been collecting coins since my dad got me started at the age of five. And one of the things my parents got me was this handbook of American coins. And at that young age, I was so fascinated with coins. You know, we had to leave for school at 7.30 in the morning, I think, or 7 in the morning. And I'd get up at like 5.30 just to read through this handbook of coins and memorize all these random facts that nobody knows or nobody cares about. And then I would spend hours at the coin store on a Saturday afternoon. And I, in those days, I lived and breathed coins. And so I wish I had been able to remember to bring this, but it's just tattered and I drew all over it. I mean, I was a grubby five-year-old kid, so I wrote my name all over it and it's a mess, but I really spent a lot of time in that book. And later on, when I was about 11 years old, I joined the Boy Scouts and there we used another handbook and that was the Boy Scout handbook. And we learned a lot of great things from the Boy Scout handbook, you know, tying knots, camping skills, survival skills, swimming, you know, different swimming strokes, cooking, how we were supposed to conduct ourselves as scouts, the uniform and everything else. And it's been over 16 years, I figured, since I finished my scouting experience. And I think it's safe to say that it really was one of the most enriching experiences of my life. And thinking of how the scout handbook was so useful, the principles that we learned from it, it really kept me and my fellow scouts kind of on the straight and narrow. You know, there were a lot of boys in our troop who came from broken households and they certainly could have, you know, veered the wrong way. But I think the fact that we were in scouting and we were learning these useful life skills and participating in a lot of wholesome activities like hiking and camping, it really kept us out of trouble in those years. Now the Boy Scout Handbook I think is an invaluable resource for scouts and influential in helping form young boys into young men. However, I think there's a much more important handbook of sorts, if you will, that contains information uh, and contains words for both men and women of all ages, and that of course is the Bible. And the author of Psalm 119 describes how the Word of God can impact people's lives. And then the, the writer of Psalm 119 talks about how he himself would live out God's Word in his own life. And so let's take a little uh, closer look at the text, starting in verse 9. And this section of, of the psalm begins with a question. It says, how can a young man keep his way pure? And another translation puts it, how can young people keep their paths pure? Now, some scholars surmise that the author of this psalm may have been writing to a group of young disciples. And at any rate, the author recognizes the difficulties that young people, maybe young men in particular, have in keeping their thoughts, keeping their actions, keeping their hearts pure. And maybe it is true that young men have more trouble than any other group, but I think we all, as human beings, have struggled with this at one time in our, our lives or another. And just simply because we're sinful by nature, right? And we struggle with sin. And the psalmist answers his question, uh, kind of a rhetorical question that he poses. So how can young people keep themselves pure? And he says, by guarding it according to your word. And so just as I uh, said that the Boy Scout handbook contains information that helps kind of train boys for their years in scouting. The word of the Lord contains what we need for living our lives in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. This is our handbook for life, if you will. And missionary and author Elizabeth Elliot put it this way. She said this about the word of God. She says, the word of God I think of as a straight edge, a ruler, for those of you who don't know what that is, a straight edge, which shows up our own crookedness, 
We can't really tell how crooked our thinking is until we line it up with the straight edge of Scripture. So that's what the, the Bible is what keeps us pure. It, it, if we live our lives according to God's Word, we can keep our paths pure. Now, the psalmist goes on to describe six ways in which we are called to live out God's word in our daily lives. And the first thing that he wants us to be mindful of is that we are to first seek God with our whole hearts. The psalmist declares that he will seek the Lord with his whole heart so, so that he might keep his commandments. You may remember a few weeks ago, we looked at Psalm 86, right? And in Psalm 86, David prayed that the Lord would give him an undivided heart. He said in verses 11 to 12 of that psalm, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. I will glorify your name forever. And so we must approach the word of the Lord with hearts that are wholly seeking to know him. One of the things that I learned from going to seminary is that, you know, the Christian faith is so much more than having an academic knowledge of the Bible. We had professors that were probably some of the smartest men and women in the world in terms of knowing the scripture and not passing judgment on anyone, but they probably, some of them maybe didn't even believe in the Bible which they were reading. So they were, you know, they could probably quote back and forth throughout the whole Bible, but they really did not believe that it is the Word of God. And so I think we could know all kinds of things about the Bible, but if we don't seek the Lord with our whole heart and have that desire to really know the Word and believe that this is the trustworthy, uh, inerrant Word of God, then it just really does not mean very much. It's just kind of a nice compilation of stories or a history book or something else. But we really have to seek after the Lord. And this is also seen in verse 12. If you uh, look down to verse 12, Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. And so it's this desire to seek the Lord with our hearts and then uh, be open to his teaching, be willing to receive his word as teaching. Now, secondly, the psalmist talks about hiding the word of the Lord in our hearts. And in verse 11 in the ESV, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And think about storing up, you know, um, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So storing up the word is treasuring the word of God in our hearts. Now, the more that we familiarize ourselves with the Word and the more that we commit the Word to heart, we'll, I think we will have less of a tendency to sin, that I might not sin against you. I look at it this way. You know, if, we, if you fill your bodies with nutritious food, if you eat healthy food, you're more likely to be healthy than if you were to eat McDonald's every day, for example. And so if we immerse ourselves in the word, if we surround ourselves with things of the Lord, we are more likely to be spiritually healthy than if we kind of take in all of the junk of this world, all the things and, that are floating around us. And I'm reminded of Proverbs uh, 2 verses 1 and 5 where it says this, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, that's verse 1, Verse 5 says, Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now Warren Wiersbe put it this way. He said, It's not our promises to the Lord, but His promises to us that will give victory over sin. So again, it's not... We talked about, you know, not things that we have to do per se, but it's what God has already done for us. And so if we immerse ourselves in his word, if we read his word, if we ruminate on his word, and if we take his word to heart and that becomes our treasure, then 
we will be less likely to sin, then we'll, we'll be more likely to live in a way that is pleasing to him and to live in a way that, that he, he wants us to live. And next, number three, the psalmist talks about declaring the word of the Lord. In verse 13, um, it says, With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. And I was thinking, what does it mean to declare the word of the Lord? And living out the word of the Lord in our daily lives, yes, it, it does involve committing it to heart. It involves kind of that private time in the word. But I think it also involves public proclamation of the word in, into the world around us. And I was trying to think about a few ways in which we can declare the word of the Lord. And one of the ways here, as we gather in corporate worship, right, pastor, or the, the worship assistant reads the word of the Lord aloud. And so the word of the Lord is proclaimed and it's declared aloud. And every so often we do read together corporately. And so I think it's important for us to recite the word aloud together and read it together. And as believers, we're also called to share the word with others so that they may come to know the Lord. So declaring the word of the Lord is kind of speaking the word of the Lord so that others may come to know it. And I think among our fellow believers, uh, we can share scripture, right? Sometimes, you know, the Lord gives us a word of scripture for a particular person and we might share that word with them, and that might be an encouragement to a fellow believer. And then for ourselves in our daily lives, right, we can find encouragement by bringing to mind scripture throughout the day and speaking it aloud. Maybe you have that favorite verse or verses that you've memorized, and there's times when, you know, things get rough, and you can just remember, you know, a, a verse that that comes to mind and you can kind of just say that aloud or say that to yourself and that brings comfort to you or that brings encouragement to you throughout the day. And so uh, the word of the Lord should be on our lips. It should be something that we, we speak aloud and something that we share with others. And I think it's just a good thing for us to have the word of the Lord on our lips. Now in verse 14, the psalmist speaks about delighting in the word of the Lord. And I thought about as we grow more in our faith and in our walk with the Lord, it should be a delight for us, right? It should be a joy for us to spend time in his word. And I pray that each one of us would be able to experience that longing and experience that desire and just experience that real delight of immersing ourselves in the scripture. And I think, again, for me, I was thinking back to my seminary time when it was just so dry in a way because we were constantly having to study the word in a way that was so academic and not very spiritual. And I must admit that there were times where it was not too much of a delight to be in the word because it was just this turned into a textbook. But it really should be a delight for us to just spend time reading the word and, and learning more from it and learning the ways of the Lord. And I was reminded of Psalm 1, uh, going all the way back to the beginning of the Psalms, in verse 2 where we read, But his delight, the righteous man, in, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And so it shouldn't be a chore for us, to read the Bible and all of us, whether you've gone to seminary or not, I'm sure you've experienced those dry seasons in faith or, you know, you get to Leviticus or numbers in certain parts and it just gets a little dry and it's like, oh, what, a, what is this that I'm reading? But I hope that as we read through these verses from Psalm 119 today and see how the psalmist in so many ways lived out the word in his life and the joy that he experienced from it. I hope that we would be reminded that the word of the Lord should be a delight for us. The word of the Lord should be a treasure for us. Number five, um, 
living out God's word in our everyday life involves meditating on the word of the Lord. It involves meditating on the word of the Lord. And that's in verse 15 where it says, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. And for me, I would say, I, when I was thinking about the different things, this was a little more difficult thing for me to think, or as I was thinking about this verse this week, I thought, hmm, what does it mean to meditate on the word of the Lord? And I guess that I always, for me anyways, I don't know how you all, when you read scripture, but I always try to kind of, well, seek the meaning of it or try to analyze it or what is the word saying here? And so uh, that's often how I read the word. And, you know, right, in our Bible study groups, we tend to do that, right? There are a lot of questions about the given passage and what is the, was the writer, what is the Lord trying to say here to us? And we try to pick apart the word. And I think, friends, that there are some times where we just have to sit with the word of the Lord and meditate on the word of the Lord. And when I was in college, and uh, once again, when I was at Fuller, we were introduced to this ancient practice called Lectio Divina. And it's a Latin term for divine reading. And this is a method of taking a passage of scripture and it's reading it in a way that is totally different from any Bible study that we would be familiar with. But I think it rather gives us a... Uh, uh, a guideline, not that you would have to follow this, but just a guideline for what it means to meditate on the Word. And so in this method of reading Scripture, you read the passage four times, or it's, it's often done in a group, and you might have a leader read it, and you know the rest of the people are just sitting and listening. And the first time is just a simple reading, and the people are kind of listening to the reading. And the second time is called kind of a meditation phase. And you're just supposed to kind of sit and listen to that reading of the word and not try to analyze it in any way and not try to get any meaning out of it anyway, but just to ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate that word to you. Then the third time involves kind of praying through the passage. Maybe, you know, as the word is read, that you would be kind of praying those words out. And then the fourth time is called a time of contemplation, which I think is similar to the meditating phase. But again, it's just this time of resting in those words and just hearing those words. And it's a little abstract, I think, for our Protestant sensibilities. Um, it's still often practiced by our Roman Catholic brethren. And I, but I do think, and, I, and I'll admit, I was a little skeptical of it when we were introduced to it at Fuller and, and when I was in college. But I think, you know, when we consider this passage, uh, in this verse, verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts. What does it really mean to meditate on God's word, whether you use a format like Lectio Divina or another method that you use yourself. But it's an important practice for us, I think, as we consider God's word, because I think, at least for me, sometimes I try to put all, cast all my human understanding on the word or, or the way I think it should mean. And sometimes we just have to listen to God's word and soak it in and kind of tune out, right? Kind of tune out all of the things that are going around us in the world and tune out all of our human sensibilities and really just ask for God to speak to us through his word. So meditating on God's word, I think, is another thing that the psalmist brings up. And finally, the psalmist, once again, he repeats his delight in the word, I will delight in your statutes. And he commits to the remembering or memorizing the word of the Lord in verse 16. I will not forget your word. And I think that also goes back to verse 11 where it says, We store up, I have hidden thy word in my heart. I have stored up the word in our heart. And a few weeks ago I was saying something I think about my Sunday school days and 
you know, you all might remember that card stock with the three lines and the little dotted lines across, for all of you who are old enough to remember that, and printing with big letters, and we, the Sunday school teacher would give us a strip like that, and we'd have to copy the Bible verse down, and we'd take it home, and then they'd have us recite it again the next week. And I was thinking about many of the verses that I still remember today. Those come from learning those back in Sunday school days, you know. And I think about when we commit the scriptures to memory, they really become an integral part of who we are, right? They become a part of our lives. They become a part of us. And when you can memorize those scriptures and like I was saying, you know, declaring the word of the Lord, if you have a little bank of scriptures in your mind or, you know, in your memory, then you can go back. And when there's that time when you're kind of going through a difficult season in life, or maybe a friend of yours is going through a difficult season in his or her life, and there, you need to draw on a word of encouragement, you know, that verse just comes to you. And I think that's really uh, a great thing if we can memorize and commit God's word to our heart. <clears throat> and back when I was in college, my roommate and two other guys, I was the only Protestant in a room uh, in an apartment of Catholics. And they would occasionally invite me to attend an evening mass. You know, my service was in the morning and they had a student mass at 10 p.m. Can you imagine that? But anyways, they would invite me to this uh, mass for students. But one of the things I remember about going to that mass is there one of the uh, parish priests there was in his 80s and he was a really nice guy. He was in his 80s and as you know in the Roman Catholic Church they have all the lessons. So they have the Old Testament and then they have the epistle and then they have the gospel and the priest is the only person who is allowed to give the gospel lesson. And what was so striking, one of my friends told me, do you notice, you know, normally there's kind of like an altar boy who comes up and holds the gospel book for, for the priest to read the gospel lesson. Now this priest, he never used the book. He would, he memorized the gospel stories and he would just, and it wouldn't be word for word. You couldn't open up a version and get just exactly word for word. But he had memorized those stories so well, he would tell it. It, w it wasn't just, I'm reading from the Gospel of Matthew today. You could tell there was a real excitement. You could tell that it, he just knew those back and forth. And so there was something very powerful when he brought the gospel story. And then he would give a, a little sermon, a little homily, but almost more than the homily, it was that, that telling of the gospel story that was just so powerful. And I think for me as a pastor, I just pray that I would be able to get even close to somewhere to that point, to be able to just preach the word from memory, right? To be able to memorize the word and just to be able to talk about it almost without even preparing in a way. And for all of us to just be able to commit scripture to memory, you know, maybe you have a favorite scripture passage, maybe you could start with that and just try and memorize a line or two a day or however you do it, but to store up that word in our heart and remember it and commit it to memory. And so it really becomes a part of who we are. And so as we've discussed these verses from uh, Psalm 119, I think it's really a good psalm for us to read through all 170 verses, yes. And that which, but it really reiterates, if you read throughout the psalm, right? It reiterates the importance of God's word in our daily lives. And this book, the Bible, this is the word of the Lord but it is a handbook of sorts for our lives. It's a guidebook of truth for us to live by. And one of my favorite verses is Psalm 119, 105, right? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the, the psalmist here writes that 
Young men can keep their way, young people can keep their way pure if they live according to the word. And then he describes these six ways in which he delves deeper into his relationship with the Lord and into his word. What, right? Seeking the Lord with his whole heart, storing up the word, hiding the word of the Lord in his heart, declaring the word of the Lord with his mouth, delighting in the word of the Lord, meditating on the word of the Lord, and then memorizing the word of the Lord. And so if we desire to grow in our faith and our walk with the Lord, we must be guided by his word. And maybe there are some here in our audience or out in our Zoom audience this morning who have really not read God's word or are not familiar with his word. And I would encourage you to just, we have copies of the Bible here at the church that we can give out, or you can find it online on various websites. And I would encourage you to just delve into God's word and to spend time in it and, and do all these things in God's word, because I think you will really be blessed and you'll really be enriched if you read his word. And I think it's one of the ways that we can really just draw closer to him and learn more about his ways. And I also hope that we would, again, remember that we are called to apply his word in our daily lives and not, you know, not just read it and not just know what it says. But I'm always reminded of that verse in James 1.22 that says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And so uh, my final word to you this morning is for us, let us go out into the world and to be doers of God's word and not only hearers of it. Let us pray. Gracious God, again, we give you thanks for your word and that indeed it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we just thank you for um, giving us your word. We thank you for giving us access to your word here in the United States. We are blessed and we ask that you would just bring the word to people who are yet unreached. I think of uh, Dorothy Forsberg and we just thank you that the Yom Bible is complete and now uh, the people have uh, that Bible accessible in their language. And we just ask, Lord, that we would be able to live out your word in our daily lives, that we would um, hide it in our hearts, that we would meditate on it, that we would declare it, that we would delight in it, and that we would just be a people who seek to follow your word, to seek to live your word, and that we would just be your word out in the world. And so we thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as you are able, and we will have one last hymn, Thy Word Have I Hid in My Heart, and I guess it's a little bit maybe an unfamiliar hymn to some people, but I hope you will uh, join us and and for the singing of this hymn. Thank you, Pastor Derek. And yes, we'll sing all four verses of thy word I have hid in my heart. Thank you. 
Please remain standing for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Have a good week, folks. Oh, the oh, doxology. doxology? I forgot. Oh, you my goodness. Join us in Yikes. the doxology. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Good week. Yeah. I guess the heat must have gotten to me. Go in peace and stay cool. Yeah, that's right.